All right, we're going to resume the open session. Um, one of the uh, NHGRI is involved in multiple common fund programs. Uh, one of them that we have a very close association with is the Human Health and Heredity in Africa, or H3 Africa Initiative. Uh, NHGRI provides co-funding to this initiative, and for that reason, we think it's particularly important to keep Council apprised of progress in that. So. Jennifer Troyer, Program Director in HGRI, is going to give you an update on H3 Africa. Hi, thanks. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I took my first lesson a couple of years ago. Um, apparently, people in the back can't hear me. Can you hear me now? All right, excellent. Um, and so at the NIH, this is a common fund program, um, but I just want to say at the beginning that it's actually a collaboration between the NIH, the Wellcome Trust, and the African Society for Human Genetics. And before I start telling you about the program, I'd just like to acknowledge that while there are a lot of people that are involved in making this work and, and everything that you're going to see, several of them are, are in the room or have been in the room in the recent past. And so um, first, Eric Green, the chair of our working group, of course, and then um, Jane Peterson and Mark Geyer, who have both retired. Um, Mark stays involved in the program, however. Uh, who really got this going, and Jeff Strewing, who is still here. Um, Ebony Madden leads our um, ethical legal social implications research program for H3 Africa. Ken Wiley is in walking in and involved in the bioinformatics and several of the research projects. Um, I would be remiss in not mentioning our amazing grant management folks, uh, Chris Darby and Diane Patterson, who have done Yeoman's work in making sure that all the funding um, gets where it's going and uh, everything gets filled out as it should. Um, that has not always been easy, um, that we get progress reports that we need and so forth. And then Laura Scow, um, who is our program analyst for the program and makes sure that everybody's where they're supposed to be when they're supposed to be there and keeps things running. So H3 Africa um, is a program that was established, um, actually, that we're now in the fourth year of funding. So the first funding happened in 2012. But really, discussions about H3 Africa started several years before then. Um, and the vision for the program is to enhance capacity for genomics in Africa on the continent by African researchers. And so when um, the African Society of Human Genetics, NIH, and Wellcome Trust started talking about this program. It was recognized while there was a sort of rich source of genomic diversity and material and interesting diseases to study, there was not always the capacity available and the resources available for the scientists on the ground to direct research programs in this area and to conduct them and so a lot of the collaborations were going outside the continent rather than inside the continent. And so um, the overarching goals are to increase the really ability of researchers in Africa to be internationally competitive in this field, um, in part by, by increasing the amount of intercontinental um, collaboration that goes on and also to expand infrastructure, um, both physical infrastructure and human resources on the continent, and work on recognizing that there are particular ethical considerations when working with highly underserved and under-resourced communities, and to try and solve some of those issues in a genomics context for Africa. Um, as are all common fund projects, uh, this, this met the bar of being high risk but high reward and having long-term goals. And I will say that at the beginning there was a lot of doubt, I think, about whether this was feasible, whether this was the right time for this program, whether it would move forward. It was funded for five years. As I said, we're in our fourth year. Common fund has n now given us permission to um, propose the next stage, the next five years, which is one of the reasons we're bringing this to council now to get um, some comments about about where we're going and where we are. Um, and but I think that 
it is now seen as, as quite successful. However, our goals were long term and another five years will greatly benefit the program. So I'm going to talk about that a little at the end. Um, but first, where are we now? And so where are we physically and where are we in terms of science? I'm gonna talk a little bit about both of those things. Before I start though, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the kinds of awards there are for those of you who don't know already. Um, there are infrastructure awards, and those consist of um, an H3 Africa Bioinformatics Network um, and biorepositories. And the primary awards, the stars that I'm going to show you are where the primary awards are, have been made. However, most of the projects I'm going to show you have collaborating sites, and those will come up later. So um, the H3 Africa Bioinformatics Network, or Bionet, um, and one of the biorepositories are located in South Africa, and then two other biorepositories are one in Kampala and one in Abuja, Nigeria. The next kind of set of awards that we have are research projects, and these are investigator research, initiated research projects looking at genetic and environmental influences of disease. And the diseases uh, can be communicable, um, so we have projects that are looking at um, tuberculosis, at HIV, or the interaction with the HIV and tuberculosis, there's um, pharmacogenomics, there's trichomyces, so pharmacogenomics particularly for some of the drugs that are treating some of the infectious diseases. And then there are research projects that are non-communicable. Um, we have a kidney disease project, we have schizophrenia, um, so several different kinds of cardiometabolic diseases, um, so non-communicable disease research as well. And that was a very important component of this going in, that it not just be um, limited to diseases that are in crisis at the moment, but, but really be the full range of biomedical research projects. Um, our research projects come in two different sizes and flavors. There are the collaborative centers, which are about a million dollars a year and require that there be at least three different African institutions collaborating on the project, as well as as many more as they want, both in and outside of Africa. Um, and most of those are cohort studies that are doing collecting and, and developing cohorts and doing traditional association, genetic association studies with disease. And then, um, and those are awarded as, as U54s, so cooperative agreements, and then independent research projects, which are UR1s, which are sort of your equivalent of an R01, so a smaller amount of money given to an individual investigator or sometimes a few collaborators. And those are the primary award sites for those projects. Then there's ethical, legal, and social implications research. Um, and these have been awarded sort of staggered over time, so we're now up to six of them. And they're rather small awards, and we might talk a little bit more about that later. Um, uh, but these are looking at issues such as stigma, um, communicating genomic concepts in different languages, um, understand the, the understanding of genetics in under-resourced communities, um, the ethics of biobanking, and those are the primary awards there. And then when you add um, all the collaborating sites, you spread out over Africa, and um, you'll notice that the purple dots, which are our nodes for the bioinformatics network, really span the continent pretty well. Um, and there are, at this point, um, 35 nodes in 17 different countries that are developing the capacity to do genomics analysis. Um, and then also, as I mentioned before, there are projects that are funded by the Wellcome Trust, and those are an award. So, this is a lot of people doing a lot of different things, but all focused around genetics and genomics in Africa, and there's a governance structure. Um, so we have several different bodies that, that do some oversight. One of those is our independent expert committee, and um, members of this council have served on this, including Val right now, um, is one of our, our independent experts. Um, and they come to our meetings, they, um, meet by teleconference to discuss the program and provide advice to Wellcome Trust and NIH about how it's doing and what we should be thinking about. The steering committee consists of members from um, 
PIs from all the projects sit on the steering committee, and that committee meets twice a week by telephone, um, <laughs> which is challenging sometimes, but we do it. Um, and then now there's forming because there is now data deposited in the web, in the um, in the informatics network, and there are biospecimens starting to be deposited in the biorepositories, and so um, we're putting together an independent access committee that will review requests for data and specimens. Um, and then finally, of course, members from NIH and the Wellcome Trust. There are several working groups, and actually our composition of working groups is sort of always changing as we <coughs> identify new needs. Um, so in addition to this list of working groups, there, there um, are now developing an HIV AIDS specific working group. And so some of our working groups are around scientific areas, some of them are around regulatory areas. Um, I think cardiovascular disease working groups are not on this list yet. And then um, what we're calling a sustainability working group to look towards funding in the future um, beyond what the common fund and welcome trust provide. Um, all of these working groups also meet either once or twice a month and report into the steering committee. And they've developed several policies and guidelines that are followed by the, the entire consortium. So what are our accomplishments at this point? I really think the biggest accomplishment comes in this area, which is one of the major goals of collaboration. This is, and I hope Val will attest to this as well, an extremely active consortium um, and very collaborative and works really hard despite the different time zones and barriers and, and being able to get on the telephone to communicate well with each other and to move things forward in a co collaborative way. And so all these working groups have produced policies that now everybody is abiding by. Um, they are working to coordinate training to make sure that their trainees in different projects have the opportunity to benefit from training that's being offered by somebody else. Um, and then there are new scientific collaborations being established as well, which is what I think was the original hope for all this. Um, training is also one of the major goals, and so there's a large group of trainees um, in across the consortium, which includes students, postdocs, you know, traditional types, as well as senior investigators, technicians, and actually administrators. Administrative training is a really important part of this because many of the institutions have never received NIH grants. Um, and then the bioinformatics network offers many courses which are taken both by H3 Africa um, members but also by outside folks at participating institutions. Um, so those, those workshops that they offer are open for additional people to learn. And then many of the trainees um, have opportunities to spend time at Bro, JCBI, Baylor, Sanger, some of the best uh, gen genetics and genomics institutes, and bring back to their home institution what they've learned. Um, another place where, where there's been a lot of progress is this area of capacity building that I heard mentioned earlier this morning as well. Um, and so while many of our sites are at centers that have a lot of resources, a lot of them are places which don't. And so, so there's limited resources, there's limited connectivity to the internet, ability to communicate, ability to get samples from one place to another. Um, and then there have been issues like Ebola, like doctor strike. Um, and as you see, many of the projects span multiple countries and have to work through the regulatory issues for multiple countries. Um, and despite all these sort of challenges, uh, our investigators are really making good progress and have a great attitude about it and, and figure out ways to make things happen. And so there is science going on as well. Um, and so this is actually a slightly old slide. We now have, at this point, 35,000 and counting samples that have been accrued. Um, and over 40 publications with many more on the way. Um, a lot of these are conceptual. What is this project trying to do? Um, but some of them are, are quite deeply in the weeds of science and bioinformatics. Um, Ebola was one of the things that many of our investigators 
worked on. Um, and then policy. And all of this is leading to, towards sustainability, which is something that we're really focusing on moving forward, um, leveraging resources and, and building knowledge and a reputation and, and interest from other organizations. So I wanted to show you that not only do we have samples, but we also have some genetics data. And so this is from um, some whole genome sequencing of some samples from Botswana. Um, and as you might expect, uh, there are about 15% of their SMDs that are not seen in the thousand genomes. And then not, a, not, <laughs> not only are there um, novel variants, but there are novel populations that are not currently represented in our, our data um, that's publicly available to date. And so if you look actually two different populations from Uganda, um, one falls sort of with where you would expect it to up there in the red circle, and then another one is completely unique down here in the green circle. Um, and then also, projects are starting to correlate um, genomic data with phenotypes, which is the ultimate goal. And so this is um, looking at transcriptome analysis in um, asymptomatic and symptomatic and uninfected people in Cartanis Finally, in the, the um, area of capacity building, um, Christian Happy in Nigeria has an award and um, to look at fevers of unknown origin, including Lassa virus and Ebola, and this was long before the Ebola outbreak, um, but he works in collaboration with Pardis Sabeti at the Broad, and um, they had a site in Sierra Leone, so we're sort of front and center of the outbreak when it started, and um, most of the samples were taken and sequenced at the Broad, but at the same time, there was money from H3 Africa for training. And so they trained a bunch of scientists from Africa at the Broad that summer on those samples, and then continued sequencing them back in Nigeria um, when they were able, through the effort of a lot of organizations, not just H3 Africa, to get their labs set up. Um, and so the near the end of the outbreak, they were sequencing in both places, at the Broad and in Nigeria, and now they're all set up to go on their own the next time there's an outbreak. So that's sort of where we are in this, this first stage, and, and ultimately, if everything goes as planned, what we'll have at the end of five years is a lot of resources and a lot of potential. Um, and so there's the infrastructure that's being built. I'm not going to read through all of this. It's very wordy. Um, and the samples um, and genomic data. And I will say different projects are collecting different types of genomic data. So there's some genotyping, whole genome, exome, microbiome, viral sequencing. Um, there are some epigenomics, so there's a lot of different kinds of data, um, but a large number of the samples will actually be genotyped on a pan-African genotyping array that is being developed right now that has included several populations that are unrepresented in many of the other SNP chips. So I think that will be very useful, um, not just for these projects, but for other projects moving forward. In addition, there have been a lot of work on guidelines, policies, SOPs, um, and some work on broad consent, on biobanking in different African countries. The um, ethics working group has been very active. The community engagement working group has been very active, really proactive in, in trying to push forward conditions under which genomics research can be done fairly and equitably in Africa. Um, so that's where we are. Where do we want to go? So I'm not going to go into this in great detail either, except that each of those lines is sort of an award and when it was made and when it ends. Um, and this is, this is the first stage of H3 Africa, and it's really been a capacity building stage. It's taken 
quite a while and quite a lot of work to, to get to where we are, um, which is that we're sort of at a steady state now of sample and data collection. We're able to store DNA, um, bioinformatics support and training is there, and ethical, legal, social implications research is going on. Um, what we'd like to do in stage two is move on to implementing this capacity. And so growing um, the sample and data collection into analysis and publications and new projects and not just DNA storage, but actually sharing of the DNA samples and other samples and balls that are being collected, um, increasing the amount of bi bioinformatics capacity and having the people that are learning now actually out there doing bioinformatics and training new folks, which is beginning to happen actually. They're getting hired um, at other institutions, for instance. And then doing more in the area of, L of LC research, but also applying the best practices that people are learning. And the goal of this is that when it's all done, there's a really big ground of support for projects of interest, both to the institutes and centers here on NIH, but also other funders, because this is not in a vacuum. And we certainly, H3Africa can do a very small part to make this happen. It has to happen with input from a lot of other people. So just briefly, this is the consortium as we see it now, which is that there are the eight collaborative centers, seven biomedical research projects. The bioinformatics network actually also serves as the coordinating center and works closely with the steering committee and working group. There are the research, the, the LC projects and the biorepositories. And what we'd like to do in the next stage are some modest, we think, um, increases in, in funding in particular areas. One is to separate out the coordinating center from the, from the bioinformatics network and let them be a, do analysis, which is what they're really there for and, and have the capacity to grow. Um, increase the types of samples that are being collected in the biorepositories so that they're useful for more types of research. Um, provide more funding for the LC projects, which were actually substantially underfunded in the first round, add a training program, a specific training program, and um, the ability to have ethics research in collaborative centers, something like the SEERS, um, and also some research projects that focus on biorepository issues and bioinformatics analysis methods. And then hopefully grow the research portfolio as well because of contributions from other institutes and centers. So moving forward, we know, as I said, that we don't do this in a vacuum. And there are actually a lot of organizations within NIH, other funding ag agencies, and then organizations that are growing up in Africa that recognize that while funding and a lot of sort of the direction of research has been um, pushed from the outside, and there needs to be more of it pushed from the inside of, um, in terms of both collaborations and support. And so we hope to be able to work with a lot of these organizations. Um, welcome GSK, Gates, um, governments of African countries, um, CETA, and then coordinate with the things that are going on in Africa already to turn a lot of the challenges that there are in conducting this research in Africa into opportunities. So as I said, there are a lot of people that are involved in this, and this list of, of both institutes and centers and, and folks that are working on this grows every day. Um, I do want to acknowledge, I think, Regina James is in the back of the room, uh, and she's been a big help. Um, and has really supported a lot of the in administrative training that I was talking about. And I'm happy to take any questions. Carol? So on, on your last slide, you list a number of um, African mm -hmm. organizations. So can you give an example of how the, the interaction with those? I'm, I'm really interested in your picture with the internal cycles of, okay. you know, enhancing that rather than the external uh, sources coming in, so how to build the internal yeah, ones. So those, those so. organizations you cited, I don't know anything about those. Can you talk about how? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so 
One of the big things that, that's happened actually in the last year is the formation of this organization called AISA, which is Accelerating Excellence of Scientific Research in Africa. Um, and it is an offspring of the African Academy of Sciences um, and the African Union, which were two of the other ones listed. Um, there's also NEPAD, which is New something partnership for development. Do you, Lon, do you know what NEPAD stands for? No. <laughs> I'm only asking Lon because GSK has actually been doing a lot of, of capacity building in Africa, and we're, um, we've been in conversations with, with some of their folks about some of the research that they're supporting there, um, particularly around non communicable diseases and potentially pharmacogenomics. Um, so, anyways, the, the organization AISA is an attempt by some of the agencies, the outside agencies that fund in Africa to move the center of gravity of both decision making for what gets funded and the management of the grants to the African continent. And so it is based in Nairobi and Tom Kariuki is the director and he was appointed probably about a year ago now. Um, and he has um, come to our H3 Africa meetings and we have gone to their launch and met with them. So there's some collaboration going on now. Welcome Trust, as I said, funds some of these awards and uh, some of the H3 Africa projects and they are moving a lot of their programs to AISA and it's possible that their part of H3 Africa will actually be managed through AISA if, when they continue. Um, Gates is also managing some programs through there. So it's just an attempt. And then IESA themselves are pushing, because they have the African Union connections, to get governments to um, honor their commitment to permit, to commit 1% of their GDP to scientific research and things like that. So there's movement in, in that direction there. Yep. I, since you alluded to GSK a couple of times, I, wouldn't, I think council might be interested in Thing that's going on there uh, because it's relevant to H3 Africa. Absolutely. So, so GSK is a big pharmaceutical company and has taken the long view of the aim of developing new medicines for Africans in Africa rather than repurposing existing medicines and taking them over to Africa. And um, so in doing that, there are a number of partnerships and near-term relationships being built. And I think it's a real testament to what you've done with H3 Africa that GSK has decided to learn from you and to, to build on the infrastructure that you've set in place and the policies and the capabilities and the relationships, in fact, rather than try to do that de novo. Um, so it, it's, it's great to see this happen and it's great to see you take the lead on that. And I will say that we're, um, <laughs> so a mutual compliment here is that one of the things that GSK has done that allows us to have this kind of conversation and, and collaboration is that they are, um, relinquishing all rights to any IP and making their data public and in fact many of their resources publicly available as well for this project. Yeah, thank you. I, th I think this is a very exciting program. The, the slide that you showed the other uh, program like MAPI and the Fogarty training programs, some of them have ended. Uh, how is it you know, is there planning so that they will be refunded or reused? So um, we're actually in the next round going to work a lot more closely with Fogarty um, to have some of the, so so there is a version of MEPI, it's not the same as it used to be, but, um, and they're actually now doing more training in the area of research and Fogarty is actually going to manage the training portion of H3 Africa and, and make it integrate better with some of the programs that they run there. Um, so so those, they're not entirely, um, they're not going to be disconnected. They're going to be integrated more and we're trying to continue to build on what resources have been put into it rather than start from scratch. And yeah, I just have a few uh, brief comments. I am on the independent expert committee of H3 Africa. I'm comfortable with the independent part, not so comfortable with the expert <laughs> part. Um, however, in listening to your talk, uh, I just wanted to point out uh, a few things. Uh, 
some of the successes, uh, from my perspective, is definitely the involvement of young African scientists. Uh, there's, <coughs> it's, it's really been amazing. There's very excellent uh, young trainees, and their involvement's great. Another thing is the, is the collaborations. You mentioned it. But the culture of collaboration has definitely changed over from the first uh, year to, to the current year. People really are collaborating, and you do see really a shift in the culture uh, there, which I think is a, a, a great success. There's obviously a lot of logistical problems. A lot of them have been overcome, but there's even things like uh, culture-specific consent forms that we don't necessarily uh, think about so much here. Uh, their bio net uh, is first rate. Uh, yeah, I didn't talk a lot about that. And uh, <coughs> there's a lot of increase in the training opportunities, uh, uh, both in Africa as well as some collaborations here in, here in the States and probably in the UK. Uh, <coughs> uh, it, there are diseases that are being approached uh, that uh, would probably be disorders that would have been approached uh, in this country 50 years ago and are now uh, uh, still being studied there and need to be studied there. For example, uh, rheumatic heart disease uh, is very prevalent in uh, underdeveloped uh, countries and African countries. And, uh, so maybe going along with Lon's point, maybe uh, penicillin is still a drug that uh, uh, has a purpose there and doesn't need to be repurposed. But uh, th there are there are some issues, some things that have, have been sort of slower than expected. For instance, uh, they there was a goal to make an African uh, specific or an African enriched SNP. SNP array, high density array. I'm still not sure where we are with that. So, so current projection is that it will be um, in the at, at hopefully April May time frame. So before the next consortium meeting is supposed to be there, but there are still negotiations going on. So. Yeah. So, so that's an area where, you know, that that's the same that's answer well. that would have been given uh, two year years ago. ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's always. Uh, four to six months in the future. And, uh, uh, you know, sometimes uh, perfection is the enemy of good. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, another issue that I've raised in some of the committee uh, meetings is really the need for the SNP array with technology improvements and going to, uh, uh, you know, whole exome, whole genome sequencing. People uh, are still in favor of the SNP array, uh, but that's sort of my only uh, negative point. Yeah, and I would say one of the other areas where things really lagged was recruitment. I, mean, I, I think most pro recruitment, so getting IRB approvals and actually getting things going, um, there was a while when it looked like people wouldn't be able to meet their goals, and really in this la it was the last year that changed. Yeah, I was going to bring up that too, but the numbers you gave here, 35,000, is pretty good. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. A very, very big difference. Yeah, yeah um, that was a terribly interesting presentation. Thank you. It's very exciting, and the notion that there will be data from Africa about genetic variants that aren't seen necessarily here or in these larger collections is very exciting. Um, but my question is about um, thinking about Africa as a site. It seems ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's so many countries and so many, so much variation across the countries. But, but if, but I, w and I wonder if um, the some of the ways that we think about programs or research projects that um, are in the realm that I'm more expert, not really expert, but more expert in the LC program, uh, might really be quite inadequate to the task of thinking about the issues in H3 Africa. Now, it's also likely that I, because I don't know a lot about the LC grants, for the, and they're probably very focused on particular countries and particular issues with consent, et cetera. 
But it really strikes me that this is an opportunity to think creatively about barriers and facilitators which are more um, organizational, which are more political, which are more economic, uh, which it, not so much you know, how somebody explains genomics in a population that they're really not at all familiar with that, that you know, the scientific concept, or that people are afraid of donating blood because blood is a very special commodity in some parts of Africa, et cetera. But whether you are thinking maybe about recasting ELSI research in a way that I think could be quite creative, um, and I don't, re I didn't see any of your other working groups that might encompass that, but anyway, just a question whether that's come up. So Gail, that's a great question, and I don't know if, if Ebony wants to talk about this at all, if she's in the back, but um, I, I will fill in unless she comes up to a microphone, which is that you're right, the individual projects are very specific. Um, but there's an ethics working group that has really taken on this challenge of the bigger questions. And so um, the, some of the first work that they did was in tackling the, the question of broad consent and sample and data sharing um, across the continent. And one of the things that became, that was very clear at the beginning was that there was a, a huge difference in the way different IRBs or research ethics committees were viewing this. And so um, they actually applied for and got some funding to bring together um, research ethics committee members from all the different sites. Um, so I think we had, and, and Ebony might remember exact numbers, but something like 35 to 40 um, research ethics committee members in the room um, talking about their concerns and what they would consider acceptable or not acceptable. And then they were brought back a year later, and the, the tenor in the room had changed so much just in spending that, that period of time both in the room and then the intervening year with emails and updates and the report back from the, the meeting um, to not, we don't like broad consent, but how would, how would we be willing to accept broad consent? And their recommendation at this last meeting was that in, at the next time this happens, which will be in Senegal in May, we bring policymakers. And so that's what's happening in May, is policymakers from different countries are coming to the table. Um, the other area that that group has tackled, and Ebony, I had said you might want to come to the microphone and add something if I missed something. Um, <laughs> but one of the areas that that group has tackled now is the different um, regulations about biobanking. And so they've taken, yeah, so, they, so they've taken where they could find them, guidelines um, or policies that ex or national statements about biobanking that exist and compiled that and are doing some analysis and some writing um, about that. So they are looking at, I, I don't know if that's exactly what you meant by these bigger issues. This is also the reason why we wanted to have a collaborative center for ethical, legal, and social implications moving forward rather than just having individual projects. So go ahead. Yeah, I mean that there's that that's sort of logistics and development in a working group isn't quite research projects, but it's very interesting, and that has a flavor of the kind of thing I was talking about. I'll be quick to help Rudy's blood pressure. <laughs> um, as you move towards implementation, what are phenotypes that are shared across the various centers that you could actually put together a cohesive, you know? Continent-wide would be ideal, but probably not that far, but m multiple centers working toward a shared goal. So, so that's a great question, and so we have another working group um, that Jeff Strewing works with, and um, which is a phenotype harmonization working group, and they have identified eight core phenotypes that everybody is looking at, and you know, some of the, you know, they're, they're not very deep or complex. Um, but then they've also set standards for measures for additional phenotypes um, that could be explored. And then there are five, with, through the consortium, there are five, really six grants now that are looking at um, various aspects of cardiovascular disease. So they're coming together around hypertension as a phenotype that they can explore. Um, so that is going on. So I guess um, I would echo the positive comments that have already been made about the about H3 Africa, but also 
think piggybacking on a comment made by Gail, it's just about the and one issue you raised about the rather limited amount of funding that goes to the, the ELSI program within mm -hmm. this initiative. And I just wondered if you have any thoughts about a strategy for how to get more money to allocate to this, this particular component. Well, well, and how I, we I, can be <coughs> useful too to help you do that. I, our current strategy has been to ask Common Fund to more than double, I think almost triple that budget, um, that portion of, of the program. Um, but I don't, we don't have an answer from them yet um, of what they are and aren't going to fund in the next round. And so we should know by April. And, um, I, and then if they don't, it's a conversation that we're going to have to come back around to Institute to ask for additional funding to, to get some of these activities going in a more robust way because they really do have limited budgets now. So I think all, this, this all sounds great. I was curious about how you think about um, sort of the challenge of balancing uh, bringing in expertise from outside of Africa where the, uh, dealing with research issues that come up with the research that aren't, uh, you know, where there's not expertise within Africa to, to, to contribute. And um, yeah, I was just wondering about how you sort of think about so the balancing act of, of growing uh, expertise internally versus um, contributing to projects. You know, that hasn't been a, as big a concern as you might think in that, um, I mean, we all know what we do in genomics now it requires all sorts of expertise from all over. And, and certainly there um, is no uh, policy in H3 Africa that says you can't tap into expertise from anywhere. But there's also a lot of expertise on the ground. It just hasn't had the resources to do what, what they need to do. So, so it hasn't been as hard a balancing act as you might think. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Jennifer. We probably need to move along now. Um, 